Aloha. Good. Good to see everybody. Take the time. Take the time to um, welcome each other to the sit. Welcome everybody. Oh, it's good to see you, boy. Has it really been just one week? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Feels like a couple months since last Sunday. <laughs> hey, good to see you. Good to see everybody. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> All right, well, there might be a few more folks joining us. Uh, we'll start with our sitting. So just as usual, finding for yourself a posture, a seated position that feels more or less comfortable in this moment, you feel like you might be able to settle into with some stillness for this next period of time. And of course, we always like to invite ourselves gently into this transition space to be very careful about feeling like our meditation, mental posture needs to be so different from our daily lives, from the activity we've just come from. And so as we do start to turn inward with the attention, just doing so very gently, very carefully. Noticing all there is to notice and all these undulations of the sense doors Hearing, smelling, tasting, seeing, touching. The mind and heart flowing onward. All we're trying to do is learn from a closer relationship with all of these experiences. Learn about the nature of the mind, of body, of phenomena. 
the nature of suffering and hardship that comes with those and of freedom of joy and peace that comes through understanding experiential wisdom nothing outside of what's happening is necessary And while we'll often guide students through a process of relating to different sense experiences, hearing, the body, hands, as a way of getting a sense of our natural attunement and of losing fear of a flux of experience in all these streams. Sometimes it's also important to remember the value of concentration. on one object primarily. It's hard because even to say that word concentration, sometimes a, a hardness or a tightness emerges in the mind and the heart, a sense of pressure, a sense of strain. but it really is not what the Buddha meant. It's really not what the tradition offers us most deeply. It's the understanding rather that concentration can be a refuge, a sanctuary for us in all of this wildness all of this uncontrollability flooding in in all the senses. That yes, of course, we ultimately seek to be at peace with all of it. But in part, we do that through caring enough about the mind and heart to protect it to give it this opportunity to come into relationship in a safer place, a safer way. And so today, I just want to really start with the invitation of acknowledging all of these experiences that are happening Acknowledging the flavor of the heart, mind experience right now. Seeing if there might not be some place of tenderness, a quality of wanting to provide shelter. like a fish hiding in the coral in a stormy sea. We can bring the attention to safety as we receive the sensations around the area of the abdomen. And 
And really, this is a very general sense of this space, this part of the body. Not too narrow a field, not too wide. but starting to sensitize to the fact that with the breathing unfolding naturally, we will experience a range of changing sensations in this area of the abdomen. And really, there's nothing much more complicated than that. What do we notice? There are times where having language words to help bond the awareness with the experience can be helpful. So we might notice a sense of increasing pressure in certain places of tension of stiffness, of decreasing pressure, of movement. Subtle arisings, of hardness or softness, motion or stillness. And on and on. not looking for anything extraordinary, but perhaps recognizing that the ordinary might feel quite unfamiliar. This accordion of the body, opening, closing, Expanding, contracting, providing life. And seeing what it's like to try to stay committed to this knowing. The rising intensity, pressure, tension, to the release, dissipation, distension, space. In many ways, not really watching the breath, which starts to feel conceptual but observing this series of changing physical phenomena, a lot of which we could see as air element, pressure building, pressure decreasing of motion, stiffness, release. But maybe we notice 
fire element in terms of warmth or coolness. Earth element in terms of hardness or softness. Water element, moisture, dryness, cohesion, distension. And of course, we don't worry when the mind is drawn elsewhere. The thought or attending to another experience in the body, sound. Our mind is protecting us in all of this knowing. Let's see if we can gather like a baby bird and carry it back into the nest, the safety and protection of our primary object and anchor. And seeing what that's like to offer ourselves the rising and falling of the abdomen as the breathing moves in and out, to offer it to ourselves as a refuge, a sanctuary, a shelter, a place of protection. rather than yanking or forcing or berating ourselves when the mind wanders. That there's this tenderness, this caring quality. You're offering yourself shelter, safety, security. from the overwhelming wildness. To this place where we can perhaps be with the wildness. In a manageable way. This container of care and security protection. And can you in any way feel the relief, the relief from thinking, the relief from attending to all that's outer, and putting all that down, and the simplicity of the rising and falling of the abdomen. Sometimes we find that it really is in the falling sensation that the mind tends to wander. The physical sensations can become very refined and hard to discern. So if we want, we can take just one beat at that point and notice the sensations in the hands the pressure of our seat on the cushion. Before we come back to the abdomen, 
as it begins to rise again and grow. Increase in tension. So just spending this time cultivating this connection and care. When the mind wanders, gently, carefully, lovingly, bringing it back into this place of protection and refuge and feeling and receiving the goodness of that offering to yourself.
So yeah, I just it, um I just felt like it was important to remind us if uh if we needed it. You know, these times are pretty crazy. And um a lot of tumult, turmoil out there and in in there in each of us. And there, you know, we'll sit and you know there we'll just be convinced that there are these thoughts that are so important to think. Other things so important to attend to. And, you know, sometimes there's that sense of a kind of discipline of like, okay, okay, coming back, coming back, coming back. But as long as it sort of is in that realm of like fighting or uh, kind of disciplining the mind, it'll, it'll have some quality of tension. It doesn't mean there's enough place for it. But that sense of wherever you can sort of feel the relief of the concentration, right? As the Buddha spoke of like the mindfulness of breathing is a sweet ambrosial dwelling. The sense of like, oh, okay, you know, you know, you can think those thoughts in five minutes, you know, in 20 minutes. They'll keep repeating themselves throughout your day anyways. The sense of what a relief and that goodness and that, that protection and that you're offering yourself, you're offering your mind some relief and some rest that's also building an incredible strength of heart um, to not forget that. Yeah. Okay. So, Michelle, are you ready there? Come on, you. Thanks, Jesse. Um, I think I'll take off from where you just left off. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to start with a poem by Saigyo from a book called Mirror for the Moon. He lived from 1118 to 1190. He was a Buddhist monk poet. What a wretched world this would be if this despised, quickly passing world had no place to hide away. That is, no mountains in it. I'm going to read that again. What a wretched world this would be if this despised, quickly passing world had no place to hide away that is, no mountains in it. I think that um, one of the most powerful teachers I had, his name was Myatung Sayadaw. I met him rather late in my life, I felt. Um, he had a way of really connecting with you. If, he, if you had a question and you came into his little kuti, his little place of his abode, um, and if you asked a question, he, he would lean forward. He would be connecting so fully. But when he answered the question and there'd be quiet, he would settle back. Well, and he would kind of go back, but his chair was kind of, uh, the back of it was backwards. So he'd, he'd kind of rest back, but you would, you would sense him going very deep inside. So I, I'm jumping off from where Jesse was leading us in that um, there, there can be ways that people will think of being quiet and um, still as, as a disconnect, but actually it's, it's just a deeper connection. It's a, it's a going into silence and exploring. Um, 
but often we will have that mistake even ourselves where we will feel like, oh, I have to read this or I have to know this um, in the news or in our, my community or that, that taking the time to be quiet uh, is a disconnect. But actually, it's a it's a much more sensitive, tender care. It, it's it's a rest so that we can be more um, fully connected in a wise way, in a gentle way. And, and as the example of Myatung Sayadaw is really to to show that the more I would see him go back deep inside the more I felt like he could really, really genuinely connect and then go back inside and genuinely connect that. It was like so seamless and so equal. So this world, this fleeting passing world, how important it is to have a place, as Jesse's saying, with a breath. But it's like it's like the the hiding away in the mountain is finding a breath. It's the metaphor of finding our own inner place to hide from the uh, vicissitudes of life for a while and find peace. I find that nowadays. Um, we all need so much more encouragement to dig deeper and deeper, to dig deeper and deeper, to find peace. To, it's like, this is really important. So it's not a disconnect to find peace. It's like a, a saving, saving your life, saving the world. Some years ago, I, I had a, a friend from Maine that his father was dying and he had been disconnected, really disconnected from his dad, but then he went to see him as he was dying and just would sit with him as he was lying down um, each day. And he, te he wrote me once, um, that he discovered by reconnecting with his dad and being with him in that very quiet way with no words, he discovered that each breath is holy. Like how precious one breath is, how holy it is, and such, a, such an important lesson for him. The, the, in the meditation, the breath was hard for him to value and to... Um, sink into at times. So this kind of transformed his understanding of the, the sanctuary of it, the protection of it, but the, the life-giving aspect of it. So of course, holy and precious imply that we've really received it. Like it, it's not like you might do a sitting and receive every breath, but if you receive one and understand it, that there can be that receiving the gift of life and being grateful for it. Sayada Upandita would say, um, if, you're, if your attention connects with one rising movement at the abdomen, in that rising, if you're right there with it, you're free from mental torment. You're free from the prison. And again, to connect it with what Jesse was instructing, it's like, well, what are we needing safety from, protection from? But a, a lot of it is from our own thought or other people's thoughts. A lot of the protection and the rest and the safety is uh, to, get, to get some relief from that constant um, judgment and opinion and uh, other people's judgments and opinions. <laughs> and, um, that way in which we we think self-centeredness might be wrong, but it's the design. It's our design. Our design, our body, our mind, our heart is designed for us to learn how to care for ourselves. And the spiritual world helps us to learn how to care for ourselves with the motivation of 
kindness, of tenderness, of wisdom, compassion, versus fear and anger and grief. And you know, the, the, the what starts to shift, the relief and the protection start to come from the shift in getting enough protection to find, to free fall. It's actually a kind of free fall into a deeper motivation for why we're here, why we're living, how we're taking care our clear comprehension of purpose. So this, whatever we use as an anchor, it might not be the breath, it could be sound or our hands, body sensations, but that ability to um, cultivate some concentration, which is really, it's, it's translated as seclusion. It's the seclusion. It's the hiding in the mountain. It's the rest. Um, the description, the beautiful description of that rest is, is through water, the, the surface of water, a pond. The surface is often disturbed, like the surface of the human mind. And it, it's that sense of really knowing what we're doing, valuing, coming to that stillness on the surface of the water not just as an end in itself, not just for the rest, but certainly that's important. And some days that's, that's really what we need. But there is that sense that if we have the surface of the water still enough, that we can see deeply into it and everything in the whole universe reflected on it, um, that birthright, that human birthright, the spiritual birthright of exploration is so important. So we need enough of that protection of the sanctuary of the rest to be able to see clearly rather than just through our views and opinions that are based on the past and are often based on a, a self-centeredness. As some of you have heard, I've, I've been reading a book of, um, it's called Japanese Death Poems, and they're um, haiku written uh, right at the end of one's life. It's a, a tradition in Japan. Um, for some people to want to write a death poem. Uh, but also, it's sort of like if you look at that sense of um, leaving a will when we die, it's kind of like a different way of seeing that. It would be like a, a will, but it's like a farewell poem. Often they're very moving. And this uh, man, Chogo, Chogo he, he died in 18... Six, and he was age 45. I find people's ages really interesting in terms of what they write at the last poem. And um, he said, I long for people. Then again, I loathe them. End of autumn. I long for people. Then again, I loathe them. End of autumn. <laughs> I think that's, it's so fantastic. It's like so honest. Yeah. It's like, you know, this practice is meant to be an exploration into just that pure honesty in that moment. Many um, people wrote me this week um, really trying to understand um, their thoughts about the news of the president getting sick and um, with COVID. And many people were asking kind of like, what is compassion? And what are, you know, is it okay to have hateful thoughts? And um, really brought up a lot of stuff 
spiritually for many of my students. And um, so I wanted to just touch base on a few things. Um, Uh, starting with the metta, the loving kindness, and the context of compassion in the four Brahma Viharas. So understanding that um, the loving kindness is that the definition of it is that it's love infused with wisdom. So it's it's not like a romantic love, a sentimental love, a nostalgic love, or attached love and that doesn't mean those are bad or wrong those are the experience that can seem so much like love but this metta love is a love that is infused with wisdom that's like we have to remember that um, and that the compassion is caring about the pain in the world infused with wisdom so that, that we often forget that <laughs> minor little detail, right? That infused with wisdom, without conditions, without conditions, without conditions, that the empathetic joy, the mudita, is uh, appreciating the joy in the world, um, infused with wisdom. The equanimity, of course, is infused with wisdom. It's the unconditional acceptance of how things are. So one way we can explore compassion is, is through with metta at first, through the loving kindness, where we um, look at one teaching that I find so important. It makes me tear up often is that the, ex that the Buddha taught that the experience of loving kindness is just like a mother cow on giving birth to her calf, making eye contact with that calf. And that imagery is so important. The, it's an animal and the, you know, that labor the incredible labor that has happened to give birth to this being, like all of us, all of us beings that have taken birth physically, that it's that moment of connection that, that this experience of loving kindness is like. And so if you try to translate that into your own experience, that means that when you attempt to experience loving kindness or metta for yourself, you're relating to yourself like a newborn. You're finding that connection like a newborn, a mother, and there's a mother calf or father calf part of ourselves, and there's a baby calf part of ourselves. And wherever that disconnect is, if you can find the baby calf, but you can't find the mother or father calf, it's hard, right? And if you have the father and mother calf, but you can't find the baby calf, it's hard. That's a lot of the practice is, is them coming together to have them both available. And the Buddha taught that you're practicing that for everyone, right? So that it's everyone and and so that loving kindness therefore is not about behavior a newborn hasn't developed that behavior that personality that's so clear yet of course you can kind of sense in the womb but there's this behavior um, that you're you're not tuning into you're tuning into that newborn heart that actually is taking birth every moment. Every, every moment of consciousness is new. It it's dies, it's new. Knowing over, knowing over, knowing over. It's like so that we, this is not a fabrication. It's not abstract. It's actually true. The truth of your heart, of consciousness, of chitta, mind, consciousness, is that each moment it's taking birth. It's newborn. Or we couldn't do it. It would be a memory. It wouldn't be in the moment. 
And so the Buddha taught that this is rare and hard to cultivate this. So people act like, well, you're either born with it or not. It's not like that. It's like it actually takes effort and cultivation, like you'd cultivate a garden. Um, and you can't make it happen. You, you make space for it. You make space for that, finding that connection in whatever way we can and not judging disconnect. So, you know, that teaching where you, you just try to find your heart and, and modern people just finding the heart and connecting is hard. Um, and then that um, tuning in, the attunement to the um, feeling sense, the newborn feeling sense is how you start. And of course, it might not be that you can do that for yourself. And that's a whole other conversation I wasn't planning to go into. But it's like if you can uh, feel a connection of loving kindness with um, a dog or a cat or a gecko or a goose or a um, tree or a rock or a sky, this is the practice. It's like where you can find that connection. But I hope you see where I'm going with this because um, loving kindness in itself is not focusing on behavior. It's establishing connection with all beings and the, you know, up boundlessly, the capacity for our human heart or any heart is boundless. It it's, um, includes all beings everywhere. The heart the heart actually, the chit to the mind is boundless. So wherever there's a barrier, of course, we see our limitation. We see that um, we feel that there's some aversion or fear or grief. You know, we find that limitation and one doesn't make a problem out of that. That's not considered a problem. One shifts then to either an easier being or you shift to metta for yourself, or you shift to compassion. And that the, the shift is really fascinating. I mean, really, it's so interesting when we see that when you, you shift to caring about pain, the caring about pain, remember the awareness is infused with wisdom, and so the caring about the pain is a pleasant feeling. That's how you distinguish it. So just as with metta, attached love or romantic love or nostalgia, any nostalgic love, any of those kinds of love aren't metta, but they're not bad or wrong. Just like with compassion, grief and sorrow can seem so much like it, but it isn't. And that's how you know. You're not making grief or sorrow wrong. Of course, when the attention goes to connect with pain, often it hurts and it's sad and it's okay to be sad or have the grief um, so this is not a problem or it'll feel like it's too overwhelming which is a big theme this week that i've heard from people it's just too much already you know and it's like we shift maybe to indifference um, we don't have to, but that might come up, the numbing of the heart, because it's too much. You can go back to loving kindness, or mudita, or equanimity, or pure mindfulness. This is, this is all exploration, exploration. But what, what I wanted to just focus on today is just to, to remind ourselves that when things are difficult, the Brahma Viharas are really important um, tools and skills we can bring to um, turbulent times. But to be careful of thinking we should be perfect at it or that, that anger doesn't arise when something's painful or sadness or grief, that, that, that the heart, again, the chitta, it, the, we feel. We're, we're not meant to be numb all the time. We feel, we connect, the emotion comes up. The emotion is information, it's telling us something. And then we can find the compassion is the caring about the pain. And that includes behavior. Not only does it include behavior, 
but it includes behavior that might be being done in the present that's causing harm that we know is going to cause bad karma for that person in the future. This is super important. So that however we might have related to things this week and maybe kind of all kinds of uh, intense thinking could arise, that's not the problem. And that doesn't mean we're good or bad or whatever. It, what it means is that we listen deeply and we, we learn, oh, wow, maybe I need compassion first. Maybe it's so painful. Maybe I need to care that pleasant feeling again. It's pleasant. It's energizing. Compassion is energizing. It feels good. You can feel care about grief, anger, whatever it is. You, and if it's too much, maybe you shift to non-behavior, to metta. Maybe you shift to metta for the tree outside your place your abode, right? Like you can just, you shift. It's like you shift to a chipmunk. You shift to a gecko, or as Jesse said, a fish. Then we take our time. Maybe that's enough. But remembering that compassion includes behavior that's happening in the present that's causing so much harm that we know they're going to have bad karma in the future. And so having compassion does not mean that we don't want to stop behavior. So if we have a, a being that is causing a vast amount of suffering in this world, compassion doesn't mean that you don't stop the behavior. You stop the behavior with all the metta in your heart and with all the compassion in your heart. And I hope you're following this because this is really critical, whether you have a bully in your neighborhood or a bully running things. It's like the behavior, it, when it's not acceptable, you do your best you can. If it's causing pain for many people, you do your best to stop it if you can. And it doesn't have to be done out of anger or fear or whatever. It can be done out of knowing that stopping that behavior is actually the most compassionate thing we can do for everybody, but also for that being. Everything falls back into motivation. And the more you practice this, the more clear we can be. I got so many text messages. I'm a bad person because I'm thinking bad thoughts. That is not what this is about. This is about listening to those thoughts and going, hmm, oh, anger or oh, grief or whatever. And what is the best approach here? Well, maybe I need compassion for a while. Or just adding this in, but I'm finding that um, focusing my attention on beauty in nature is very energizing. The, the mudita, the third Brahma Vihara, like connecting with beauty and appreciating it, being grateful for it. It's so important. It brings courage, it brings strength, it brings a balance to outrageous behaviors. And if you're feeling like you're becoming unbalanced to the point of not being able to access <laughs> anything but overwhelm or it's too much, it's time to balance your nervous system, right? We talked about it last week, but just reminding you it doesn't have to be um, necessarily outside. It could be a beautiful flower that you buy and bring inside. Or some beautiful stones, like my professor in college, my freshman year in college, when I went to visit him and his wife, they had some rocks and a um, bowl 
on the living room table and they just poured water on it every day when they walked by and that was their beauty that they connected with each day. So, so be careful of thinking it has to be a certain particular kind of beauty, but it's something that, again, it touches the heart. It, it helps us become more connected to our heart. Even if it's like we're feeling numb, then we find our heart numb. Oh, feeling disconnected, numb. Then we can feel loving kindness for that, or, great, or um, compassion. Oh, where is it? <laughs> oh, probably ah, okay. Well, where I live, um, our parks and beaches were closed down for a month again, and um, tourists haven't been allowed in for many, many months. Um, and often when that happens, um, some creativity has to come up in one's life to sort of shift one's behavior. And I noticed this at the beginning of the um, pandemic that where I live, the um, grocery store didn't, you know, didn't have as much choice. And they would run out of rice, for example, or run out of bread or run out of this or that. And it was very upsetting to people for a while. Things have kind of stabilized some, but still that this is a remote area. It, there isn't that sense of choice always when you go into the store. And at first, at first it was really funny because I would notice that I would have that feeling like, oh, well, what am I, what am I gonna eat? And then it would be like, oh, well, maybe I should try this. And I, I started trying things that I never would normally buy. And it was, it would turn into actually, you know, some not, not good things, but it was an exploration that, it was like a forced exploration that was actually good for me and really interesting. I'll never forget the day I bought these um, English muffins that like I had some sort of weird idea that they weren't like good for me or something. And they were so good. I have to say it was awesome. You know, this is sort of what I'm, I explored in the grocery store aspect of the pandemic where I live. But then um, this whole thing of everything being closed down, the parks, and there's a park right near where I live. I'm not kidding. It's like the closest place you can go for a walk, like other than my little dry little neighborhood. And uh, I just, all through so far, all of this, I haven't gone there. This is how, like, what a block I've had with this place. And actually it wasn't open, but this federal park um, next to it, um, I'll let you drive in and park there and you could walk down into it. And there's some grassy areas and um, in the early morning there's sprinklers going. So just a side story, in 1952, there were 30 Hawaiian geese left in Hawaii, in the state, 30 Hawaiian geese. Um, and now in the whole state, there's 2,500 they've really successfully, they're making a comeback. It's very heartening. Um, but often where I live, there's another place that you can go that sometimes you might, if you're really lucky, like once every couple months, or maybe every month if you go early enough, but you might see one or two. And um, going down into this place and it was grassy, there were 12, 12, nay, nay. And I'd like to read to you, um, the word nene comes from, um, it's a Hawaiian word and it comes from the bird soft, gentle call. The, little, the literal translation of the word means to chirp as a cricket, to croak. 
whimpering as a sleeping infant. The goose has also been known to moo like a cow. And it, you know, it's like, um, seeing those Nene taking baths and the sprinklers and like seeing them so happy that the tourists haven't come back yet, you know, they're gonna have to kind of hide. But it's just like so happy, like so heartening. And that gives me the strength and courage to keep going, you know, and practicing the compassion. So be careful of thinking you have to go through metta to compassion to mudita. I think in these times, sometimes it's helpful to go from mudita and then to equanimity maybe where there's that remembering the unconditional acceptance. That, like if I'm feeling overwhelmed or like it's getting too much, it's like accepting that. Like that's where the equanimity is a lot in my life through these turbulent times is just that, all oh, right, the, the totally unconditional acceptance that it can feel too much and that that's okay. And then maybe there's compassion for that, right? And compassion for everybody, all of us going through this. This is not a self-centered pandemic. This is not a self-centered election. This is not a self-centered blah, blah, blah. Like it's like, it's endless that, um, how I could feel in those sections. And um, just really recommending that we all um, try not to drown too much in that, the sense of maybe judgment of ourselves if we're not as perfectly spiritual as we think we should be, that maybe the practice might not be as strong as you think it should be. Be careful of judging it because we're up against, you know, if you look at pain, pleasure, neutral, there's often for most people more unpleasantness happening, not for everybody, but there is if you're, if you care about the world right now, if you genuinely care and you're connecting, there's often at the least more unpleasantness happening. And, and just try to remember that you get upset because you care, that you really care. You worry, you get concerned about friends. There are many people suffering right now. And we care. And it takes an enormous amount of work right now, spiritual work, to um, keep digging deep enough to find the Brahma Viharas, to find the, the wisdom practice, and to um, keep doing our work which we're here to do, bringing love and wisdom, finding it in ourselves and expressing it in the world. Thank you, Michelle. So we do have some time again. Um, if anyone has any questions about your practice or questions about the instructions, questions about Michelle's talk, um, you can go down to the participants area on the bottom there and um, Click on it and over on the left, a little blue hand will arise like Kim wins right now. Hold on one second. Let me close this other thing. So, hi, Kim, are you there? Hi, can you guys hear me? Hi, yeah. Hi, Kim. Hi, so nice to see you both. Um, and thanks so much, Michelle. I was just curious, I really appreciated what you said about, um, you know, but I mean, I, I didn't have any experience of this at all, but like, I definitely found myself feeling some joy over the karmic balancing that's been happening at the Republican <laughs> Party. And um, I was talking to another teacher of mine, Vinnie Ferraro, um, 
And he was saying that like so often we want to go straight to compassion because that's like the more spiritual way of being, but that really like anger can be useful sometimes. Um, and I guess, you know, the I'm, I guess the wisdom coming in is when you are sort of trying to determine, do you have that balance of a healthy amount of anger or is it becoming an un unhealthy amount of anger? Um, but I'm just curious what your thoughts were about that. Yeah. Michelle, do you have a yeah, preference? I can start. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I might rephrase the question to, um, or no, I guess I'll rephrase my answer of the question to, is there a healthy enough relationship to the anger? I don't think it's the amount of anger as much as is there a healthy enough awareness that's connecting with it or is there a healthy enough awareness with the joy or the sadness or that that the question really is am I able to listen to this information you know there's hearing seeing smelling tasting touching thinking that's information and is there a healthy enough discernment of the information because that's where the motivation comes from. It's not um, the appearance of, I don't know if I think of it as too much or too little anger. It's more receiving that information well and discerning it and seeing if there's something to do with it or not that would be skillful or just getting a better relationship with anger because most of us don't have that great a relationship with anger. Like, oh boy, what a, what a time. We're living in a time that, you know, if you don't have much of a good relationship with anger, <laughs> hallelujah, we've got a gold mine happening now, hopefully, you know. Yeah, so I think you're, the, the direction is what you're describing. Sounds great. I, it's all I think about it's... relationship, relationship, relationship. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's one of these places that it's very nuanced, and I think it can be oversimplified in various ways. Where I do think, like, you could say, that's sort of like, there's like a Western framework of psychology there, right? Of like, oh, it's healthy to have anger, and it's healthy to have love, and it's healthy to have lust, and it's healthy to have wanting. And, and so there's like, that is like the sort of Western psychological thing, right? Where you're like, okay, there's a healthy balance of things. Now, in the Buddha Dhamma, there's no, like, healthy amount of hatred, right? Or, like, healthy amount of, like, wanting or ill will. So you have this dance of, like, okay, well, if we recognize these things as, like, actually inherently um, uh, oppressive, you know, inherently toxic on some level, the hard part is, which, which is, which is the hardest thing, is to then not, if we're going to, if we're going to see that, of like, actually, we want to be liberated from hatred. It's not good for us. It's not good for anyone. But there, but we're not therefore going to go try to like repress it or judge ourselves or hate ourselves for it or try to get rid of it. It's the question, again, as Michelle is pointing out, it's like, well, what's the relationship? And then, of course, we have anger. And of course, th there's hatred. Of course, there's ill will, because we care about things. And we're, vulnerable right we can, things that we care about are harmed things that we care about are threatened and because the mind isn't perfectly equanimous it protects itself through anger through rage through ill will or through wanting through addiction you know that to understand that yes these are of course very natural understandable aspects of the heart so you can at the same time feel like oh well, i understand hatred isn't good and it's toxic on some level but on the other hand you can allow it to be. You don't need to run from it. You don't need to crush it. You don't need to oppress it, but you can be interested and have enough space to explore it and to be like, wow, what is this? What is this energy? What part of it might be rooted in something very wholesome, caring, loving? What part of it might go into something unwholesome because there isn't the sense of, sense of stability there because it feels threatened? And so I think that the investigative part of Vipassana is always like this, like, not judging what's happening, not giving ourselves a hard time, not trying to manipulate it or convince ourselves we shouldn't be angry or all that stuff we're going to maybe tend to do because of habit and, you know, cultural uh, 
you know, voices in our head being like, oh, you shouldn't be angry. You know, you should be a good Buddhist. You should care about this person who's like done all this harm. And now maybe he'll stop, you know? And this other thing of like this sense of, well, mudita, joy. It's like most people's concerns have not been that they're overwhelmed with grief for the president's pain, right? In terms of our world. It's like, I'm feeling, people are saying, right? It's like, I'm feeling joy. Like, and like joy and the possibility of like things might go wrong for him. And like, am I a bad person for that? And it's like, you know, okay. It's like you, in Vipassana, it's always breaking it down into more and more subtle, nuanced, momentary experiences. And seeing it's like, maybe the joy is in the sense of relief, right? The joy of being freed from, from oppression for ourselves, for others, that is like a legitimate joy in the world, right? And that your joy for the entire world and the future of the planet might for like a little bit of time be greater than the, your compassion for this one person is not some kind of like horrible moral conundrum, you know? It's like, yeah, okay, there is this thing. And, and there's an there's a, there's a increase of joy and a decrease of compassion at this point. And then we can explore. It's like, well, do those things need to be mutually exclusive? You know, I think for everyone who might have that sense of like giddiness, you know, or yeah, that sense of uh, just the basic humor, like you're saying in like irony, you know, or, or karmic, like the equipoise of like, oh yeah, we're the owners of our actions. The sense of like, oh God, like if you were really a fly on the wall in his hospital room right now and he was alone and no one is there and he's like broke down crying, right? Sobbing or terrified. I wonder how many people really would still have that hardened heart, right? That like, yes, we might feel like we're happy about like a sort of conceptual notion of what's ha what's happening and a relief of that but if you were to be more in contact with the suffering of anyone right and the agony and the grief and the terror in anyone's mind i'm i'm suspicious that people would really still be as joyous uh many of us as joyous as we think and in the end if you were again it's like a process of like how do we hold all of this complexity of behavior and of um of of unconditional love and acceptance of truth of, of how things are and of ownership of action and all of these things. So thank you for, you know, kind of bringing in that, that, you know, complexity of it. And there's just, there's, of course, there's so much more to say. And yeah, Michelle, you have some additions. Oh, your mic is up uh, on your forehead. We can hear your thoughts. Oh, and you're muted still. Uh, just to remember that the four Brahma Viharas is, is helpful. So if you, if you are with yourself, practice all four, because it's really important that when we see there are, we, we have behaviors that aren't pleasant. Every human being has behavior that isn't all pleasant. <laughs> even me, even, you know, everyone, <laughs> right? You know, it's like, this is hard stuff. It's like, we all have stuff. And so that if we can do all four Brahma Viharas with ourselves, where we, we do the metta, not, we, I just want to remind everybody, metta is not about behavior. So you can go to the hospital room and practice metta and and still, and still shift to compassion and include the behavior. You see, it's, you really have to see that the, these, the Buddha was going for inclusiveness, including every aspect. And um, some of us are stronger with one of the Brahma Viharas than others. So somebody might go in and they're more just naturally equanimous and they might be doing some things are as they are, things as they are, and then maybe compassion's harder and they go to metta. Do you see it? But it's like to remember that these practices, when push comes to shove, the more we understand them and we, we get how helpful they are in these times, um, that, that they are meant to be inclusive of um, all aspects of ourselves. <laughs> hmm. uh, Kathy, you there? Kathy Wang. Hi. Hi. 
Hi. Um, so Jesse, I really enjoyed your, um, your meditation tonight. Um, and I think my question just relates to my practice lately. Um, so I've been doing sort of two sits on weekends um, and I usually do one sit on weekdays. Um, and I've been finding that in my meditation, my practice, it just feels like, cause I've, I, I feel like I just sit and, and that's honestly like the best description I can give to my meditation right now, like, because unless I have an intention to actually um, say like, oh, I'm going to try to practice concentration and actually try to follow my breath. Um, like, it's just, it's very fluid. And I feel like I don't really, um, like there's no intention or even like the desire to try to control things. So sometimes it's um, like there's lots of thoughts and then sometimes, you know, by the halfway point, like the thoughts kind of slow down and then I get into more of like a sort of just like a more open space. Um, and then sometimes it's just thoughts like this morning, it's just thoughts for like uh, the, the, the whole sitting period and that was okay. Um, and I guess, I guess my question is, is this okay to practice this way or should I be doing more of like an anchoring practice? Um, does it matter? Um, and I'm still, <laughs> pain continues to be my friend throughout mm -hmm. all of this. Um, and I'm really finding that like, I'm starting to value that because pain doesn't come as quickly now and you know like it's towards the end of my sit like the last 20 minutes the last 10 minutes like that's when it gets really hard and like time does this weird thing where it doesn't make sense anymore um and yeah i don't know if you have any comments on on that yeah that sounds great you know i mean just great first of all that you're sitting as much as you are, you know, I mean, just having a daily practice is hard enough. And then, you know, sitting twice a day on the weekends, it's, it is amazing how much a second sitting in your day really has such an impact where it's like, oh, you come back, you know, again, it's not just this sort of like one dip in and it's like, oh, the coming back in, in one day in, in our daily lives can have such a profound impact. And, um, and that's great, you know, to have that rhythm. Just so, first of all, on that level, you know, it's wonderful. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I I totally trust that you're what you're what you're describing in terms of your practice, in terms of just sitting, and just whatever comes, and however we kind of manage that and explore it, or tune out, or get lost, or whatever. Just like that, that faith in you're showing up. And you're showing up in this sort of way that feels, um, I think what I trust about it so much is the, that sense that you're not feeling like you need to do anything, right? Because that is partly what gets hard when you start applying more method, is you start to feel like, oh, well, if I'm doing something, there's a built-in kind of mechanism in the mind to be like, well, they're therefore I'm trying to get something or a kind of like contraction in the heart mind that can develop. and there's such a relief of having a kind of more open, spacious practice along those lines. Um, so I think, well, I would say like in the big picture, just that I, I totally trust that. I think it's like a great way to have as like your foundation. Um, and over time, it is valuable to be exploring method on different levels, right? And and to say that like the the, one of the reasons, one of the, one of the values of having an anchor is not just like I was descri describing in the instruction where you have a place to go and it's restful and it's like, oh, it feels simple, simpler than just like all the craziness of everything. And there's a relief in that and there's a concentration builds, et cetera. There's also the, the increasing ability to see when the mind goes somewhere else, why is it doing it? 
and you start to see that there, there is volition involved in the mind going to another object, going to a thought, going to a sound, going to whatever, going to a fantasy about this. And you start to see that it's like, oh, this got boring or dull. There was a little bit of aversion and something pleasant arose and you start to see that. So the, the value of having like a stick by which you're measuring the, the, the movement of the mind and the motivation and the volitional moments is helpful. And it's going to be the kind of thing that's harder to see when you don't have that stick, right? When you're kind of, when the, when the attention goes from one thing to the next, it can feel often like it's choiceless. But on a subtler level, there's always a choice. There's always a volitional moment of why the mind moves to one thing or another, even if it's just loud. There's fear, there's, there's something going on at very subtle levels. So it's just to say that like as your foundation, I thought like to totally trust what you're doing and to totally trust this sort of more open way and at times to really get that there is a value to method um, on all kinds of ways. So whatever method you end up bringing, whether it's a little more concentration on the breath or sound or loving kindness or any of these sort of things that you'll start to kind of try to cultivate intentionally, that there will be a value to it. And to not, some of, some of us really need to feel settled in the more the way you're doing it before it feels valuable to then kind of bring a little more concentration in, uh, or a little bit more loving kindness or a little bit of these sort of other things that actually it's like sitting in the sort of wildness and kind of getting settled in that um, in the way that you're doing provides provides something um, important in order for the these other muscles to start to feel useful and not feel like you're you're kind of manipulating and trying to make something happen so yeah I think it sounds great yeah Michelle, do you want to add anything to that? Just so. Sometimes it takes, it could be 10 years before you add it in something. So don't, don't worry about it. Could be totally. two years or everyone's different. So let, just keep listening. Yeah, totally. Mm, cool. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Harry, are you there? Oh, you're muted there. There we mm -hmm. go. So uh, I'm in Queens, recovering from COVID. Very similar symptoms to uh, the president. <laughs> I'm doing well. It doesn't sound it. But my voice is kind of, but I'm really doing well. Uh, and the care has been wonderful. But it's, it's curious. I, <laughs> I can't find anything but enormous compassion for Trump. It's twisted, malevolent, dangerous, megalomaniac, lying, delusional man. I can't find anything but compassion. <laughs> and I have, believe me, I, I'm a ranter about him. This experience, really, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And, and it's, uh, what a twisted, tortured human being. This guy is dying inside. He's taking some of us with him. And that's the problem. But so I really do wish him a recovery and then he loses the election. That's what I'm, but that's the pragmatic part. I can't get past. See, I'm a New Yorker and I'm, I was poor in the Bronx and he was rich in Queens, but I can relate to some of the forces I'm about his age. I can relate to some of the forces that shaped him in regard to women, in regard to everything, you know? And so it's not that strange to me. Um, I don't know, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's, it almost makes me, but it doesn't, afraid that I feel so much compassion. But in the Catholic Church, we used to say, Hate the sin, love the sinner. And this is exactly that. This guy is all fucked up. And I hope he gets well. And then does goes away. So the sin is the behavior, right? Right. And the sinner is the meta, the it essence. Is, is the person. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And it, there's nothing more humbling. It, COVID, when you have it like you have it, is so humbling. And it's so powerful. And you're so open, Harry. It's really moving. You know, we're cheering you on and uh, sending you lots of metta. And uh, that's well, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. It's going very well, though. I mean, really, what? I get stronger every day, and, uh, and I have to, the care here at Queens has been absolutely magnificent, including the food, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what about that cheesecake you had last week? That was good. <laughs> <laughs> that was I've less. On, I've moved on to, uh, I've got a liking for something I never eat, a fresh fruit bowl with a watermelon, and a, I, you know, it's, no, it's really, it's, that's a remarkable thing, and I have a view of the colaus, and, and the, my God, doctor has cared for 300 COVID patients. He's an absolute wow. hero. He keeps volunteering. Let me tell you a story. He, he's an he's a ex-military. He was in Iraq for two tours and uh, Afghanistan for one. Doesn't believe in any of it. The only thing he believed in was, was ending Osama bin Laden. And... He said he has never seen bravery to match these nurses. It's just some, they're putting their lives, 13 of them have gotten them ready. They have to, have to bake them to come back. So he tells his kid, his wife's a Vietnamese internal medicine doctor, and he has a five-year-old daughter. And he, tell, he tells them, uh, you know, I'll go back and volunteer to do more. If it's okay, first he asks his nurses, and then he said, if it's okay with the family, his wife says, fine, because I, you may get sick. And his five-year-old daughter says, that's all right, daddy, you make me sick all the time. <laughs> it's, 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 he's, he's just, I can't, I can't sing this guy's praises enough. He says, I'm really worried of, about the president. I said, I said why? He says, I'm worried about the office. I'm worried about the country, not about him. But he's what he's hopeful is that you can only hope is that it will wake people up to uh, take appropriate measures and, and prevent it. Anyway, thank you, Harry. Thank you so much. Really, really beautiful. We're so relieved that you're doing well and getting good care. Yeah. So yeah, we'll we'll all be sending Meta. Hmm. I think that's probably a good place to end it, everybody. Mm, lots of love, lots of love. Yeah, really wonderful to see everyone. Thanks for keeping making it. It's like, we all know how important this is to all of us, you know, to keep us connected and go through all the ups and downs. So yeah, have a great week and we'll see you next weekend. Yeah. Aloha. Aloha.